OT, Marshall Jefferson, and DJ Twizzle. We're going to try to help you answer some of the questions and some of the roads that we all face when we're making a record from the studio and taking it to a DJ and hoping to possibly make a huge club hit if that's your road. And then at the end, viral radio, terrestrial radio, and you possibly have a pop hit. So let's get started now. Introduce, you know, Jason Fats is known from Fats and Smalls. He's had huge hit records over the years. He's a UK producer. Um, we're gonna let we're gonna let him speak a little bit. Moti has been producing since 2005, and he's a champion with the Dutch crowd, and he's doing major things in Europe, playing all over the world. Marshall Jefferson, for those who know, is decades in the industry and has many, many big records under his name, has helped launch a lot of people's careers. And DJ Twism is an excellent record producer. He has, he's a great engineer, mastering guy. I mean, as a DJ, he runs these a lot radio along with Lunar and Ibiza. It's just a lot of, and myself, I have, um, <laughs> I've produced, let's say about more than 25 years and had a few top 40 hits in the UK and working right now on a new record with a legendary artist named James Train Williams and we just hit the top 40 chart in America uh, as an independent record label. I'm praying to God that we can move on to the next step which would be going in the top 100 and playing in the game with Ariana Grande and all those major artists. So even for me, this road is a, a questionable road that we have to go into because we don't really know 100%. Um, when you're doing things, you think at the moment it's right, people tell you, you know, they stop you, oh, yeah, we can do this, you know, if you try this, if you do that, and then you start to say, wait a minute, I have to take a couple of things from here, a couple of things from there, try to piece them together, and hope that I can make sense of it, and hope that I can actually get to that end goal. So, I would like to start, I'm gonna let Jason start a little bit, because he's right now actually enjoying a resurgence with his song, Turn Around with Armand and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, um, thanks, Lenny. Um, what, 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 what do you want to know? What's, um, what's, the, what's the question? Uh, well, first question is the return to house music and bringing it back and getting a label to grab it and doing a video. You know, yeah. pretty much the basic story of where it began for you. Again. <laughs> um, well, basically, I've been making music now for over 30 years. I started as a producer. Um, and. Um, I prior to turn around, but I won't go through the, the whole of my career because there, there, was, there was many years prior to, to Fast and Small. But prior to turn around, I, I made over 100 records, released over 100 records. Um, I probably made about 400 records, you know, um, only for about 100 I've made it out. And, um, and I had the success that many speakers have promised to me many times, you know, we thought we were on the cusp of a hit record. Um, you get the big major record deal, you know, I did various different projects. Um, and uh, and then we turned around. It was just like it was a year of of um, really really prolific year for me. I was getting a lot of support from the full intention guys from Sugar Daddy Records. I was doing stuff a lot of work for DMC. So I was doing a lot of remixes, I did some remixes to Terry. I was doing the Peach Boys, some real classic classic stuff. Um, and I kind of found my sound. I found the thing that I was really really passionate about. You know, this this proper house music sound. This. The original house music sound kind of introduced me to this scene. Um, and in pursuing that, that was how the kind of turnaround came around. It wasn't, I didn't go in the studio with the intention of making a hit record. Um, I made a record that I was going to DJ out the weekend. Um, that week, I actually made um, about five tracks. Uh, turnaround took 12 hours to make. Um, it happened. Um, I knew that there was something special. You know, I get this thing when I make when I'm making music, I get goosebumps. But I like my, you know, my, my skin turns like a crocodile. You know what I mean? It's kind of like, um, and I get this like, you know, 
uh, someone says it's called shooting floss or something, where you know, the, the hairs on the back of the neck stand up. With turnaround, that's that feeling. That's the, what I try to grab onto. When, I, when I'm work, making my music, when I feel that feeling, um, I try and sort of push it in that direction. But again, it's kind of, it's trying not to um, listen to the chatter in the head, you know, go with the flow. Someone said to me, uh, in my early in my career, if you want success in the music industry, it's a lot of hard work and good luck. And, um, but good luck comes with a lot of hard work, you know. Um, so, yeah. Well, you know, you, back in the day, you didn't have the internet where you are all blessed and lucky to have now. So you can throw something quickly up on the internet and get immediate reaction, you know. We all understand SoundCloud and YouTube, and we all know that the viral part of this industry is probably more important than anything else. You know, even seeing someone, it's like sending out an email, making sure your YouTubes are in the right place. Your Facebooking, I need X amount of Snapchats. I need likes, you know? And this is where I'm gonna ask this man, because he's now, we're gonna go from back to the future to the future, because he's in right now doing that and living that and fighting every day like all of us, you know, on a, on a little iPad going, you know, I gotta make sure this is here, I gotta make sure this is there, how important this is, you know, people see my track on this block and that block. So can you give us your day, you know, what your day would be like? Um, well, I think the important, important right now to get a lot of exposure is to have a lot of support from fellow DJ. And because everyone is always online and checking all the, the track listings, um, uh, yeah, how, how more the DJs uh, support you, the more people can see what you're doing. And <laughs> yeah, I think, I think that, that's for me, that, that's how I grew. Like, um, I, I started sending out all my tracks to, to all the big DJs, and at some point, one of them, if, if they like the music, one of them is going to pick you up, and all the other DJs are looking at you, playing this way. Um, um, yes, yeah, so the more DJs start playing, and more, and more, and more, and when that happens, labels are no issue, and labels want to sign your tracks. Uh, well, right. But now we turn to this man. You oh know, man, I've been waiting for this. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. You know, here's the hardships of the business that we've all, you know, dealt with, and people saying, oh man, you ain't gonna say the work for you, you know, and you're in it, <coughs> Your boy says to you, listen, dude, come on now. Stay at your job. This man has proven that you can do this if you have a dream. And he gave me that inspiration in day one. And you know, I say to them, you know, who I look up to? These guys, because these guys paved the way for all of us today. So I want him to give you a little bit of a background on what his day to day to now is and how he got to this point. You can sum that up. Okay, first, first of all, a lot of things uh, from 30 years ago don't apply to today. Okay, when I first came out, there were like 20 to 25 new dance records every week coming out. Now, uh, one service told me there were releasing 60,000 songs every week. Right? That's not, count, that's not counting track source, that's not counting Juno, that's not counting iTunes. Right? So you're talking about 100,000 songs a week covered for people just like you and me, right? So all this stuff from 30 years ago, it does not apply now. Um, everybody I've ever worked with, I, I said, I'm not going to work with you unless I can make you money, right? Make you money and make me money. So to make a hit in 2016, you got to throw out everything, all this internet stuff. I get like... But a thousand uh, songs in my inbox, junk mail, bam, I'm not listening to them. I got a life, I don't, I don't have time to listen to a thousand songs. Any, you imagine any, a thousand songs? Anybody worth getting your song played is not gonna, has an inbox full of song, full of music, and they're not gonna listen to it if they want to live a life, you know? So that's gotta be, that's gotta be. So how do you get them to play it? You have to go old school in a certain way. You need artist promotion. You need to promote yourself as an artist to, you know, elevate yourself out of this crowd of 100,000 songs a week, right? Um, it, it, it's a big ass pool now, and 
you have to get people to notice you. So uh, now, at some point, you may find out who the, the big radio pluggers are, you know, and 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 uh, you may get financed with which I got. I got uh, my new label was started a couple of years ago. We had the finance. We got you know billionaires like finance them. Uh, and what we found out is the big pluggers, the major ones that get you played right alongside Beyonce, they won't take your song if you don't have an image, if you don't have a story, if you, you know, because they won't know what to market. They, they don't know how to market you. So no matter how hot the song is, they still won't take it unless you have an artist, a, a marketable artist, right? Because if they if they take you up take you up if they they charge they're charged all this money and they don't get you played on the radio that makes them look bad <clears throat> that makes them look bad they want to look like winners so they can continue to charge that amount of money well, yeah, because, so because that's every time you have a winning situation no matter what field you're in you want to play with the winners and not everything you also get is a winner yeah. even though you believe in it. Yeah. I mean, we've all been down that road. Oh my God, I got a top 10 record. The label's telling you, I got a top 10 record. Your mom's telling you, it's the bomb. Relatives are the worst. Friends. <laughs> Stop, don't do me. Remember this. My wife has said to me many times, that record's terrible. Three months later, it's playing. She'll come out and say, no, that's a cop record. Whose record is that? I said to her, if I listen to you, I'd be out of business already. You know, and I love her. But she, and she knows, and sometimes like I um, didn't mention it to her, and she heard, and she said something, and I thought it was not so great. I listened to the women too, because women dance, and men come right behind. Yes. It's always the trick. Put the women on the dance floor, place the screaming, and all the boys come around, and those are the guys with money. And those are the ones that can support all of us. So I'm gonna make another question now. Here's a very important part to the, all the aspiring record producers. Dr. Twism. <laughs> Dr. It's because we fight all the time over mastering and production. Yes. Yes. And this guy's really great at this. And I'm going to hit him up for this question. And my question is like this. How important is that mix down and that record to be for a pre-master going to someone who needs it mastered and ready to go out to get to the DJs? Can you explain that? Oh my God. <laughs> um, I mean, as as a label owner, um, I mean, you get you get tracks uh, for release, and um, we get we get them. I mean, a ready master, but we make it mandatory to get a pre-master because mostly. <coughs> Um, the masters are, I mean, it's all right, but I mean, if, if a master doesn't sound the way it has to sound, like the feel has to be there, I mean, and nowadays, I would say 99% of tracks out there would be so much better if the feel would be right, if the mastering would be just on point. And not everybody who mastered maybe 10, 15 years ago is the right one to master nowadays. Because a, a, a track like, like the one from Jason was mastered back then in a totally different way as it's mastered now. And it's the same with Lenny's record, what's, what's in the top 40 now. Um, if you would imagine how it would sound like 20 years ago, it'd be totally different. it would be totally different. So, and you I mean, and it's a good example, we have multi, uh, multi here because um, it's also, it depends on the style, what you're producing. Um, a lot of mastering engineers, they don't take in consideration what genre it is. They just master it, how it comes and finish. You need, as a mastering engineer, you need the feel for every individual track. Like an EDM track or a Deep House track, you would master totally different than like a Soulful House track, a disco track, a jacking track, whatever it is. But as a good mastering engineer, you have to, you know what I mean, not just run over it. Like don't just look, use presets. I mean, 
You need to take your time, and mastering takes time. Like, I can give you a good example. I mastered the, uh, the D train track. The mastering process of, the, of that track was almost seven days. And this is why, because you, mean, you, go, in, you go into the, in, in your studio, you do your first run over it, you get the feel for it. Then you go in again the next day, you listen to it again, and you try to get that feel again, and then you hear something, you think, you know what, this is something that has to come out more. And this has to come out more. But you mean, you're only gonna get these things if your pre-master is right. And this is what I'm gonna get into now, because a lot of people don't understand what is a pre-master, right? And for a mastering engineer, you mean, especially me, I make it mandatory, it has to be minus 6 dB at peak. What is at peak? Okay, let's get to that, very important. Um, I get master sim, and, and, you know, I mean, and the artist say, hey, you know, I mean, here's the pre-master, it's minus 6 dB, and you listen to it and you're like, oh my god. Like, where did they actually see on their love meters, where is it 6 dB? You have to take the peak, the loudest part, and this is really important, you have, you have to really understand this. The peak level of your track is the loudest point in your track. So if you have a massive vocal in there, and it's screaming or whatever, that is your peak level. Not in the beginning, in the intro, where you normally have like a low kick or it's filtered or whatever. If, if your pre-master is a minus six there, but then at a peak, it's like minus one or something like that, that's not a pre-master. Because he's, he, what he's trying to say is, give the guy some headroom. Right. Don't, don't, don't make a break. Don't make a break because that's not the right way to do it. Already, you already squat. In other words, you're defeating the purpose of getting someone to enhance what you have there. Right. I, mean, I, I can, me as a mastering engineer, I can only make your track shine if I have the room to do my magic on it. If I don't have that, I mean, how how do you want to do it? Like, how how can I make your track sound fat and and give it the feel it needs if I don't have the space to do so. So for, for, for those, I mean young or whoever here, you know what I mean, if you're sending a pre-master, make sure it's minus 60 dB, 24 bit, at its peak, get your get the entire mix right, and then you're also gonna be able to get a good master. Something Marshall had mentioned before, you know, about image. Very important people. You must believe in a genre that you feel comfortable in, and that means sticking with it and championing it. Sometimes when you do and skip around and you try to do a little bit of this, like a deep house track, I do an EDM record, you don't get the momentum necessary to help you move in that position in the chart or getting the most important part is your fellow DJs to believe in you. Because in the beginning of the game, these are going to be your people. They're going to help spread your name by viral, you know, and you want to be as close to them. You want to make sure that you, as a producer, record label, you are setting your goal to get that call Cox played my record. It's a perfect example. Labels love that. Look, Carl Cox is playing my record. This is hot. 4,000 people screaming. That's a big step when you never had anyone play your record. You know what I'm saying? You, you know, or there's a master mix show on FM radio that people, a DJ that you don't know is playing your record. And somebody, they would call you today, they would text you or chat in or, or actually tag you. Oh, wow. Louis Vega played my record, or David Morales, or even Moti, or Twism, or Marshall, because he liked it when he heard it, he wanted to know what it is. And the image, people, very important, you need to stand out, because this mediocre thing ain't happening. And what I mean is not happening is there's a lot of it. Can't just put a track out there. 
please, you know, we're talking 60,000. Spotify has over 80,000 new entries every week. How the hell do you think? That's between those two. Right. That's between Beatport and Spotify. Where are you? Where am I? You know, I'm fighting. Where am I? Yeah, Marshall and I, we're fighting for the, for the, you know what? I'll tell you even, even further. Now I've decided to play the radio game, okay? And I got radio pluggers involved. And it was a point where, you know, I sat with the program director at WBLS in New York. And WBLS is a very, you know, it's a, what they call urban adult contemporary station that happens to play some dance music and R&B and stuff. And the program director said to me, this is a daytime record. I was like, what do you mean? He says, well, that means I'm going to add it into the daytime rotation. So now I'm thinking, this is no longer a club record now. i got to play with daytime radio. So where do I go? And I asked him. He says, well, you got to get a radio plug. And that radio plug has got to take you and your artist through every avenue possible to get you seen. Okay? Because when you go to these people, they don't know who we are. In club world, we're all famous. When we step out of the club, in, into the real world. Listen to me, real world. They go, who? You're not Britney Spears? Oh wait, you're not Ariana Grande? That's what I'm dealing with. How the hell do you fight to, to win that? Some people I know take a Britney Spears or this is an example, any commercial track, and they put beats on it, and they call it their own. They put their name. You know, that's how some people feel that their notice is there. You know, I'm here, I'm here, you know, and we're all fighting to be great at our craft. And all of you are going to be fighting. If not, some of you probably are already probably taking notes and going, I'm not doing that. Right? Because everything I'm saying with Marshall Twism, Monty Jason, it's not right either. But in our world, it is right. So what I recommend all of you to do is take pieces, formulate a plan. Okay? Yeah, take the best for you. Take the best of what Jason says, take the best of Moti's stuff. Take you know, what you were saying about um, you know, sticking to your own genre. Your own genre. I was here two years ago at standing at the bar. Carl Cox had just, uh, just been speaking. And then we were chatting at the bar, and he said, we got to. <clears throat> and I said, I'm working on various different productions for you know, various different people. And he said to me, Jason, stick to what you do. You know, stick to what you do, because you do it well. And, um, and I'm kind of like, Lenny said, you know, I, it was going around in my head. I was thinking, well, I'm doing productions for other people. Uh, fast forward two years, and we've now got, uh, we just had a track coming out on the Marder. Um, we've started doing Fast and Small again. Um, we've got a track coming out on Spinning at the end of the month. We've got another track coming out on Amada. We all know so, Spinning is, right? Let's put our hands in the We all know Spinning is, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so, I mean, it's like, you know, listening to someone who knows what they're talking about, really. It's like he said, just do what you do because you do it well. Um, don't di diverge from the course that you're on. You know, you've been doing this. You know you can do it well. You enjoy it because that's the thing. You know, that's where my passion is. As soon as we started going in the studio and writing songs and making Fast and Small records again, it was that thing, you know, it ignited that passion inside me again. And, um, you know, Carl was right, you know, I should listen to him exactly on that day rather than taking six or seven well, months. Well, fortunately, that happened to me. I went to a funeral for a famous sound designer in America, and DJ Baruz grabbed me in New York. And he said these magical words. What are you doing? Stop right now. Listen to me. Start making records like you made for Strictly Rhythm Records back in the early 90s. And I said, this is my answer. Who the hell wants that? He said, Lenny, listen to me. All the young people want what you used to do. Sometimes we don't see the magic that we made. And we forget the glory because of all the darkness that happens from day to day life. And that's going to make you into a better record producer, a better writer. You never feel like you've arrived, that's the thing. That's, that's the thing, team. where's the arrival point? Yeah, where, you, you, Monty, have you, have you arrived? Are you, are you comfortable where you're at? Do you feel comfortable? No, I should be better always. I want to be better, I want to be a better producer. Um, like, at some point you think you, uh, you achieved the goal you want to achieve, but you know, you think that 
first you pick when you uh, get there, that's what you want. But when you get there, you want to go further and further and further. Uh, to get back on the, the mastering part, the thing what... Uh, yeah, very important I guess it's such a... Yeah. <laughs> um, like, I know I'm not good at mastering. So, uh, what I uh, used to do, like, um, for me the most important thing is to road test tracks. I want to road test it, but I can't go to the process of like, uh, giving pre master to, to uh, someone else on a master, then road test it, give it again to them, go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So, the way how I work right now is that um, I put my own master on it, but like, you know, I call it a mastering strip, but it's not like. Well, but you know, yeah, a road testing. Yeah, like, I mean, we all road test. Yeah, 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 yeah. And um, you're gonna fail at road testing. Oh, yeah. Part of the game, yeah, people. Yeah. You you don't always win. Yeah. The road test is perfect because how many times you go to correct it, you say, oh, yeah, I didn't see that. Or I didn't hear that. <clears throat> well, the vocal's too low. Oh, wait, the vocal's too loud. All yeah. that stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. So in the end, um, like when you're finally finished with how uh, the track is built, how you uh, how it's arranged. And, with the volume levels of every track. Then I'll go to a label and they want to sign it. Now give them the pre-master and they can, you know, I, I give it to the, to the people who specialize in mastering. This is something you have to accept. Like the same thing like I don't mix vocals. I don't do it because it's not my strong point. If right. I ask someone else to mix vocals, I do the arrangement. Well, see, yeah, this is an important part. Um, I mean, some, some people are good at arranging a track. Some people are just good in general being an engineer. Um, focus really on what is your strongest point. If you, I mean, there are amazing engineers who only focus on vocal recordings, only or mixing, yeah. or, mixing. or mixing. Yeah. 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 If you are good in, in vocal recordings, do that only and perfectionize that, because there's always going to be a demand for somebody who really needs incredible vocal recordings or I mean. Look at Marshall. Marshall is multi-talent. I mean, he has his own microphone he built. What's amazing. And you know, I mean, look at Jason. Like Jason did it out, did it all. And does it all. You mean and Lenny, oh my god. You know what I mean? Uh, you, you try to. You know what well, 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 yeah, but what you do is over the year you perfectionize everything. What you do is you take your hats and change your hats. And we all, you know, today I'm label owner, tomorrow I'm DJ. I mean, even the booking agent, you know, in a sense, like I'm booking plane tickets to go somewhere, or, you know, whatever has to be done, you learn to adapt. Because it's well nothing people. stops. Nothing stops you. Because you have to get to that goal. I got to get this record to become a, my, my safe haven, my head, you know, whatever it is for you. And I'm going to ask Marshall this Does he feel he's arrived yet, you know, at that point? I feel like I'm getting to that point, but uh, I over a hundred thousand songs released every week. I think fifty thousand of them are perfectly mixed, perfectly mastered. I mean, it's a really high quality level out now, right? So I think the focus should be on promoting the artists because you promote the artists and you be able. To the next record that comes out, you know, people buy that. The next record that comes out, people buy that. And maybe like the fourth record down the road is the hit, right? And then you have like the foundation already in place to take it to the next level. But your focus should be on promoting the artists. And I mean, or it will never get out of that 100,000 record pile. And with need. all those other perfectly mixed and perfectly mastered records. There's a lot of talent out there. There's a lot of hits out there that nobody hears. So your focus should be on getting people to hear it and fi figuring out how to get people to hear it. And, I, and as I said before, you, you have your top radio pluggers. They won't take it unless you have a marketable artist. And, uh, and that's how you reach the next level. So uh, I think I have a marketable artist now and uh, I'm going to try to market. So 
But I, I also think that I'm getting on to that, Marshall, is, you mean, with the extreme amount of releases every week, like, if you look at 15 years ago, um, the track, a, a, a track's life was over months. You had one track, or years, yeah, and, 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 and you mean, it lasted so long. Now, the life of a track maybe has seven days. Yeah. From one feature day to maybe the other. Uh, any culture had, the, the culture itself has to be changed. We got some weak ass DJs out there. Now. <laughs> <laughs> no, because it's disposable. As a DJ, you have two jobs rock the party and sell records. Right, right. Introduce us to some. Nobody selling records anymore because they only play the record one time. They, they go to all two days. I'm going to play something in the, in the same style. Get out of here. You're leaving. Bye. You know, and that's, that's, so we have to change the culture in itself. Bless this heart, man. Get on the record. Play that record six months, a year, you know, until everybody knows that, that song. You know, so the, the, the culture itself is screwed up. It's, it's against making artists money, you know, against, so if there are any DJs here, if you got a really hot song, stick with that song. That's if right. It's, if it's rocking the party, over and over. keep rocking it. Rock it next week with the same song. Rock it the week after that. Rock it the next month after that. Yeah. But you know, you you build up your your, your catalog, uh, and, and by the end of the year, you have nothing but super hot songs instead of some playing something just because it's that genre, and it's not as hot as that hot song you played last week. Stick with the heat. And that's the part of you sell records. You got to believe yes. it's part of the game. Because I'm gonna tell you, people are gonna promise you things. Oh, I'm gonna play your record. Oh, I'm gonna play your record. Go to the next DJ. Keep going. Because 300 DJs over here, my God, there's gotta be like about 100,000 DJs. They're not all A-list DJs, but they're important as well. They will help your cause. Because again, they will feed the viral network and tag you and tag your brand. Again, branding, make sure that iconic brand is in my face. Because the many times I see it, the more aggravated I get over it, damn it, I gotta look and see what the hell this is. I happen to be one of the few that checks every email I try to as an A&R to listen to, you know, someone sending something to the label I'm trying to look to hear because I don't want to miss it. Because I do believe in all of you. Because you are the pulse of what we all do. And you may have that next sound. And people are gonna tell you, maybe it's gonna to be too left field. You have to believe in it and you may have to prove it and it may take time. At first you may say, oh no, this is not working because people are telling you, nah, it's bullshit, it's not right. Keep pushing it. Then come back again with something else. Push it again, once again. Again, over and over. I mean, the D Train record, for example, I started March 23rd with 26 weeks, and I'm just hitting the top 40 indicator chart for media base in America. We spoke in the summer, didn't we, about this? This is like ridiculous. Him and I spoke last summer about this record, that this was going to be what we're doing. Which summer? <laughs> Which summer am I making records for? The summer I'm anticipating last year, but because everyone takes their sweet ass time and promises you the world, you waiting and waiting. Don't wait. Have patience, but at the same time, get out there and, and as they say in England, graft. And get in touch. You know, get in touch with us. You know, get in touch with DJs. Hang around in the clubs. You know, meet the DJs if you like. Communicate with people. Shake our hands. Yeah, yeah shake people's hands. You know, just talk to people email, Facebook, you know, you're all in communication. And, and whilst it may feel a bit fearful approaching the people that you kind of aspire to, to work with or, or be like, it's just just do it, you know, just go for it. You've got to get out there and, and uh, make the music and meet people. And I think that's one of the points that... You know, I'm sorry. And, and get whoever you, if you get a DJ to play your record, try to... Uh, Keep pushing that record with that DJ. But I remember uh, getting a Radio One DJ uh, to play some songs for my label uh, earlier this year, and uh, I, I didn't. I personally didn't think it was worth it. 
You know, I mean, I, 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 you know, my label manager is telling me, I said, I, I said oh, yeah, we got a, a song played on, on Radio 1. Oh, right. I said, how much did it sell? Yeah, we got it played on Radio 1. How much did it sell? Yeah. How much did it sell? I said, 85. I said, 85,000? I said, no. I said, 8,500? No. 85? <laughs> yeah. 85 what? Said, that's McDonald's money, man. You know <laughs> That's a big ass people. You have to keep getting in place. I, I, if it's played only once, nobody remembers. You know what I mean? It's just another track in the mix. Don't so let that happen. Don't let that yeah, happen. Don't let that happen. It has, to, it has to keep playing. You know, you have to stay on. I mean, I, I think it's even as I said with the radio one. I mean, you want you want to get as much radio stations. You mean and radio DJs. I mean, it doesn't matter if it's a small internet radio somewhere around <coughs> even on this planet. It doesn't matter. Send them your track. Send them your track. Every little, it doesn't matter if it's a world-class DJ or if it's a bedroom DJ somewhere at home. It doesn't matter. For me, it needs to get played. It needs airtime. That's what it is. Yeah, for me, it worked differently because I'm not really a pusher. I, I'm not like I'm going to push a record for really long. As some people, how it worked out for me is like I believe in collaborations, like collaborating with other artists. Like um, what, what, what I've done is uh, I made a lot of different setups, and I just sent it to my favorite artists or artists I want to work with. And at some point, like uh, if they don't like it, they don't respond. That's just how it works. You know, you can you can send people music, music, but if they don't like it, they won't respond. And that's okay. So, but it's okay. Don't respond. No, but, okay. but, but the next the next week when I send something else that they do like, they do respond. Mm -hmm. So this way I got notices at some point. You know, first I said Martin Garrix is there. I like it. And then work something out. Yeah, there's closure. The same thing I did with Tiesto, with Major Lazer, with all the big guys in, in my scene. And this way I got noticed and afterwards I could sign up with Virgin because they've seen all those tracks and I, then I give them my own tracks, like not collaboration, like my own tracks. And they say, yeah, I'll just take that work with this, this, and this. And they look at you and they see what you have and you get a deal. Right, right. And you keep it going. You know, because what things you do, right, they push you forward. And the more, the more people see your stuff around, the majors start looking. The major labels, the A&R people, they say, wow, I, mean, I know that record because a lot of the DJs. It's part of the fun as well. The most enjoyable part of my career has been seeing the record grow. I mean, when it gets to the top, it's, it's, it's wonderful. But at that point when you start the inception of the record, and then as it grows and seeing and connecting with people, <coughs> those are the memories, you know, not having you know, working really hard. It's the best job in the world, you know. Um, and I see you just never give up, you know. Right. It's so never funny. give up. Never, 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 never give up. up. Never. So before we end, any questions? I know you probably have questions. Yeah, the microphone. Here we go. Here we go. Before they blow the, blow the. Okay, everybody, it's over. All right. Um, so uh, I grew up in the whole disco house era, and so I'm curious because I see a lot of records on Beatport now that have really massive samples and I have an inkling they're not clear. So I guess growing up in the industry, um, especially like Fats and Small, since I know a lot of your records um, were heavily um, disco samples, like how would you go about clearing a sample if it was something you were gonna release in, in, uh, independently? Um, get it cleared. Well, the best thing to do these days because there's a lot of companies around Scorpio, uh, Scorpio I think, um, which is Mark, I think Mark Summers' company. Uh, they'll do sample replays. That's the best option, really. Getting a sample cleared is, is a real tricky business, especially old disco records. Don't, you know, don't. It's just not worth taking it away. You can you can put things out. Yeah. yeah. And then um, just one quick follow up. What about for um, like just uh, like old labels that no longer exist? Well, I well to see, I'll, I'll give you a good example. Like I just I just did a, a reimagination of the inner life. Jocelyn Brown in the mountain high enough. So what I did, I did a different approach. I didn't sample, I didn't do nothing. I replayed every single note with the musicians. Um, I mean, we transcripted the entire old track and went into the studio and re-recorded everything from scratch. New vocals, everything. I mean, in that way you just have a publishing situation. I mean, what's basically a cover. 
So you, with with samples, I mean, it's 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 too risky. Well, no, you know it's not that risky, but it's well, dangerous in the viral sense. I well, get sampled every week. He gets well, yeah. he gets sampled <laughs> every week. Okay, every week. If it's a hit and it gets on the radio, yeah. you get paid. Yeah. Then you, everybody everybody's cool and. You, you, I get my cut, you get your cut. If it's not a hit, if it's one of those 100,000 records coming out every week, like, nobody's going to bother you because it's not worth it. They say, oh, he, he's only sold 10 records. We're not going to spend five grand to, to, to the lawyers to sue them and stuff. So you know, don't worry about it. But if, it's, if it gets on, you know, moves to the next level, you got to talk. And it's then you worry about it. Don't worry about every single sample you do. But that's what happened to Paul Johnson, right, with Get Get Down? Yeah. Paul Johnson. I'll tell you what, I did Chocolate Sensation, I yeah. sampled Salso. And that cost me $35,000 to pay them to clear Lolita Holloway's vocal. And that, that was cheap because Salso charges $50,000 for every sample. That was yeah. And that was, that was a top 20 hit in the UK, and it was so worth it. Because my DJ went through the roof. He was screaming, work, Lenny Fontana. And I went, thank you. Here's 35,000 to sell so. Did I really want to pay them? Hell no. But I knew it was the deal of the devil. Either I don't pay them and don't have that branding hit so I can go out and, you know, and, and spread the word of house music or stay the hell home. So I'll take the I'll take the plane ride. Exactly. I'm on my way. Exactly. If you just start a record, if you just start a record from scratch, you gotta put it on beat court, don't worry about it. Yeah. Uh, and that, that hurts me to say it because uh, I, I've never sampled anybody ever. Right? And people sample me and it pisses me off every fucking time. <laughs> <laughs> but it's an art. It's an art. Talk Terry made it talk Terry began that art in the in the eighties. I mean the so first one me. he sampled him. <laughs> He said, well, then, he came, he was you, he was you. I don't like it, man. I don't like it. If you're going to do it, I'll I tell you how to do it because I've seen yeah, tell you. people. <laughs> but I'm not saying we're not advocating it's okay. We're not advocating it. Sometimes you have to see if it's worth it. And it, sometimes it really is. It works out. You know, yeah, just works. We all have blessings from reinterpretation. Let me use the word reinterpretation. Yeah. Remember that, people. Reinterpretation. Lifting that disco sample. You're better off replaying it these days. Because let's just pretend the perfect world. This record blows up. Trust me, it's like the police. Copyright control with YouTube clamps you. Right, if you kind of don't chase I'll get you. He'll get you. Before he gets you, before he gets you Seriously, they're I'm already looking. I've had several number one hit samples from me, uh, and uh, I got paid for all of them. I, you know, a, a lot of money. And uh, I appreciate that, but I still don't like this sound. <laughs> Any more questions? Any other questions? Any more questions? From that side of the room? Run, girl, run. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm doing it. Run, girl, run. <laughs> uh, hey, thank you. Uh, it's a kind of building on the point you just made, given that this is called Hack Like a Dancer in 2016, which is um, a lot, I think a lot of emphasis, I'm a songwriter, a lot of emphasis gets put on beats in dance music. And all of you guys have had hits with great vocal looks. Right. So I would like to make a point that, you know, as DJs and the young kind of guys in here, you know, to, to put the emphasis on working with songwriters, working with lyricists, you know, you, you come up with those guys, you, you wouldn't work with those guys, you put a great beat behind the song. Right? Oh, bless that man. <laughs> okay, work with songwriters, work with songwriters. They have real songs. And then, and then you're going to get hooks that are going to stay in people's brains, yeah. and those things are going to get sampled to fuck, and that's, that's it. it. Yeah. And that's and what you do something different from rock and roll, or country music, or folk music. That's right. right. That's right. And you have pension money, people. Don't ever forget that. Yeah. That approves. Remixes pay you nothing. Publishing. Remixes is a one-time, see you. Uh, uh, 
I've had help sample and, and, and made hundreds of thousands of dollars. Sweet harmony, bang, sample, pay up. I want to give you devotion, bang, sample, money, boom. It's like coming through the air. It's like just boom. Songwriting, songwriting. You, get, you hook up with a songwriter, you, you get a song, and, and it gets sampled, you know. Uh, it's a good way to start out because once your songs start getting picked up, then you can forge your own career. That's and you get, it. you get paid for a hit song for years and years and years and years. And your family's children's children, and their children's children. And it carries on with Yeah, so it's definitely worth getting someone. Okay, you could be using the incline, having a keyboard player with you that let's just pretend you don't know how to play keys. You know, getting those chords right. Don't be afraid to collaborate. You know, he said it right, collaboration, that goes across the board. Um, keyboard player, lyricist, so a lot of times the vocalists are great lyricists as well. And you know what? Develop your craft, keep it going. And, and the songwriting is extremely important. I mean, I mean I've mean, i seen some really bad vocal, Bob Dylan, I mean, come on, right? He, he's made a living for 50 years, but he writes great songs. You know, you don't have to. No, seriously, you know, a lot of a lot of my songs they, they had off key vocals and, and, and stuff like that. But it's got to be a great song, you know, uh, you know, and, and that that overrides all. You know, it, it's, we've heard like songs with off key vocals. That's never an excuse. If, if it's a great song, it's a great song. Period. And uh, you know, if I listen to something that is uh, let a copy go like that, bang, okay, let's go, right? But you know, it. The songwriting is what we're missing. If you just put a bunch of beats down there, that's in the hundred thousand song pile. You know, mediocre, 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 you know. But if you got, you got an image, you got a image, you got a song, a great song that takes you out of that pile. You know, that's that's the ladder out of that pile. Do you know the most exciting part as a punter and as a DJ? Let's say you're listening to somebody else play music and you hear that hook, you know, let the, this party start and blah, 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 and it stays in your head. And it'll get the other DJs playing. That's right, and you're running around saying, oh, dude, do you know this record? Because blah, 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 let's get this party started. I, it's very hard for me to say for an instrumental track to go, have you heard? You know, it's like, that's what we would be saying. So if you're fortunate to get good songs, or you're afraid to do a song, don't be. Even what you may think is not good to someone else when you say, holy smoke, this is a smash. One, I'll leave this with you. There was a record in the early 90s by Elias called Follow Me, okay? Great, you know, who knows who knows. The vocal is off key, the bass line is memorable, and that song today, at the time it came out, an independent label sold over 150,000 at that time on the street, people. Because you know what they kept doing? They kept saying this, follow me, follow me, follow me. And people coming to record, I was be standing there hearing and seeing this smoke come off the record shop. In those days when records vinyl, you know, I mean, now it would be like, you know, they'll be shazamming, you know. They don't have to sing it, they just shazam in the club. A lot of times, there isn't those records on Shazam yet. So. My biggest, my biggest hit, Who Your Body, had off key vocals, right? As a matter of fact, Curtis McLean, the singer, after the first verse, he said, if you listen to the record close, he said, damn, I'm blowing it, right? <laughs> I mean, he even knew he was screwing up, right? But every time that, that Every time that verse goes, gotta have how everybody. They don't, they don't care. Well, <laughs> we are so grateful that all of you took the time on this afternoon to come and hear us talk our spiel. We hope that some of this will soak in and you can run home and you know take that scratch pad and change it all up and start over, or take what you're already doing and make it go forward. So I'd like to thank all my panel friends for their afternoon.